William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. It never pays to be friendly with murderers. Give them an inch and they'll take a yard, usually rope, tied around your throat and attached to the nearest rafter. National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Craig speaking. If I try hard, I can remember back to the days before I was in this business when on going to bed at night, I would always look under my bed. No, not for a blonde, uh, a burglar. There never was one, though. So as the years went by, I stopped looking. I just went to bed. On this particular night, however, I had barely dropped off to sleep when I heard a noise at my window. I was practically asleep, and besides, I wasn't in the mood for burglars. The burglar, however, had other ideas. Mr. Craig. I'm asleep. You can't see me, can you? No, uh, and I'd be happier if I couldn't hear you. I can see you, however. It helps me aim the gun I'm pointing at you more accurately. Well, I'd hate to have your aim suffer. Mr. Craig, I need some advice. I'm a novelist. I'm writing a book about murder. I'm calling it The Unsolvable Crime. Well, now that you've got that off your chest... What I came here for was to have you tell me whether or not the murder my book is about is really unsolvable. Well, why me? Because you've had a lot to do with murder, for one thing... Because you're not a policeman for another. No argument so far. The man to be murdered, in my book, that is, has heart disease. He's a crooked broker, a man who deserves to die. Uh Uh-huh. And he suffers from heart disease. For this illness, he takes daily, at stated hours, capsules containing heart medicine. His life depends on these capsules. Now then, the murderer, in my book, that is, decides to poison the broker... Well, that's against the law. Yes. Poisoning, but without poison. Well, get to the next chapter. The murderer steals one of the capsules, pours the medicine out, and replaces the medicine with ordinary water. Eventually, the financier takes the capsule, which contains water instead of medicine. He dies of heart failure. Well, not bad. Thank you. The poisoner can't be traced through the poison he bought because he didn't buy any. An autopsy would show no poison in his victim's body since there wouldn't be any. Most likely, the murdered man would be assumed to have died a natural death. Well? Well, what? Is the crime unsolvable? Well, at the moment, I can't see any flaws in it. Well, if you can't, then I don't imagine the book reviewers will. Don't you mean the police? Why should the police be interested in a book I'm writing? Why should the book reviewers be interested in the murder you're committing? You're not serious. You are. Well, I'm afraid I must leave now. No, no, don't move. I still have the gun pointing at you. If I had to shoot you, it wouldn't be an unsolvable crime, perhaps. But what good would that do you? Good night, Mr. Craig. Pleasant dream. <laughs> The gentleman in the dark left quickly and efficiently. So I went back to sleep. When I got up the next morning, I decided to pretend the whole thing hadn't happened. There was nothing I could do, and maybe my midnight visitor had really been a novelist. I cherished that happy thought until breakfast. Uh, Your toast, Mr. Craig, in the morning paper. Thank you. Well, you're up early this morning, aren't you? Well, I'm glad you noticed. Any resemblance between this toast and toast is purely coincidental. What does your chef do? Tan the stuff? Hey. I beg your pardon? Very interesting news item here. Halfway down the front page. Take a look. Hmm. James W. Baker, noted broker, dies of heart attack as police prepare to arrest him for embezzlement. A friend of yours? No, no, but he was a crooked broker and he had a bad heart. 
Oh, is that important, Mr. Cray? Uh, it depends on whether he took his medicine in capsules. What depends, sir? Murder. Sure, maybe it was a coincidence. But if it was, it was the kind of coincidence that goes better in books than in reality. James W. Baker was listed in the phone book. So, feeling that maybe the long arm of coincidence had strained a muscle in this particular case, I decided to pay the late Mr. Baker a friendly visit. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is the Baker home, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm Mr. Baker's niece. And you? Barry Craig. Uh, I'm an old friend of your uncle's. You're not old. Well... And you're not a friend of my uncle's. But come in anyway. Thank you. My name is Sandra. I realize maybe I shouldn't have come today. You must be all broken up by your uncle's death. Who, me? Well, uh, the family. Well, that's me. I'm the family. Your uncle must have been a lonely man. He didn't mind. He had me. And the market. And all those people. He was swindling, of course. And there were Mr. Hanson and Tommy. Who's Tommy? Oh, sort of stunted youth. Uncle's secretary. Very anemic. I always ignore him. And uh, Hanson? Hanson was Uncle's lawyer. And I fondly suspect as big a crook as Uncle was. But very spatted, you know? Spatted? Yes, on the shoes and gardenied in the buttonhole. And, and I have a sneaking suspicion whiskied in the liver. Hmm, sounds nice. Anybody else close to Uncle? No. Then it boils down to one of you three. What does? Uh, who's happy uh, now that Uncle's dead? Well, I am. Hanson is. Tommy is. Well, it just about covers the field. Well, why is everybody so happy? Uncle had some money. I get it now. Hanson stole from Uncle, and he won't go to jail now. Tommy was implicated in Uncle's swindling. Tommy won't go to jail now. And who has a very deep, rasping voice? With the trick of dropping his voice at the end of every sentence. I don't have a very deep voice. Are uh, Hanson and Tommy around? Yes, they are. They're sitting around practicing grief-stricken looks for the funeral. That happy event is this afternoon. I'd better get dressed. Sandra. Hmm. Uh, hurry, 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 hurry. Oh, who's hurrying? I am. Who are you? Barry Craig. And you? Well, I'm Tommy. I'm Mr. Baker's secretary. Well, in his condition, he doesn't need a secretary. Well, then, I'm Mr. Baker's former secretary. No, no, I'm the former Mr. Baker's sec... No, I'm... I get it. Relax. I am relaxed. Then why are you in such a hurry? Well, I have to go out to hire some mourners, haven't I? You have to hire some mourners? Well, sure, it wouldn't look nice if there were only three of us at the funeral. No, especially since you'll all be grinning from ear to ear. Incidentally, uh, has your voice ever been deeper? Heavens, no. Ta-ta. Goodbye. Oh, back again. Oh, no. Hello. Uh, good morning, good morning. I'm in a hurry. Hanson's my name. Well, why are you in such a hurry? Well, you see, my tailor is expecting me. Your tailor? Well, you'd hardly expect me to attend Mr. Baker's funeral in this, would you? Impossible. What are you doing here? Looking for a man with a deep voice. Uh, sorry, mine isn't. Goodbye. Uh, why are you looking for a man with a deep voice? Well, he told me how Mr. Baker was going to be murdered. Well, of course, that explains everything. It... What did you say? That's what I said. But Mr. Baker died of heart failure. Well, that's another theory. I like mine better. Dear me. If I only had the time, but my tailor, you know. Uh, goodbye. I stayed in my chair for a while, staring at the door that had shut behind Hanson, wondering. I'd been handed my three suspects. There was something else, though, that might help, it occurred to me, in a bookstore. And I chose a bookstore in the same neighborhood as Baker's house. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Do you carry medical books? Why, yes, we do. 
Would you happen to have one on the diseases of the heart? Well, now, we don't stock many. We had one, but we sold it last week. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. No, it's funny. The person I sold it to was a very nervous gentleman. I, well, I rather suspected at the time that he might have a heart condition himself. I see. Uh, do you recall his name? Name? Oh, yes. Yes, I remember. It was um, Hanson. That's right, Hanson. Mr. Hansen's taste in literature was interesting. It occurred to me Mr. Hansen himself, if I could pin him down, might be more interesting still. Hello, Mr. Hansen. Oh, Mr. Craig. Come in. Thank you. Well, uh, how did the funeral go this afternoon? Very sad. Very sad indeed. Funerals upset me. Yeah, I can see how that would be. Have you ever tried reading for your nerves? It's supposed to be very soothing. Oh, I'm afraid I have no patience for books. Not even books on heart disease? What was that? Why, I... Excuse me. Hello? Oh. Yes. Yes, of course. At once. Goodbye. Bad news? You turn pale. I'm terribly shocked. Tommy, you know him? Baker's secretary? Yes, I know him. Well, it seems that something's happened to him. What? He's dead. This not only upset Hanson, it set him in motion. The direction was the Baker house. I approved and went along. Hanson, who phoned you? Sandra. Apparently, she'd been visiting friends, returned home, and found him. Of course, it... Might have been an accidental death, which would mean another point of uh, coincidence, but I don't think so. However, if he was murdered... You seem to have murder on your brain. You said something about the police thinking Baker was murdered, too. Not the police. Me. Oh. Oh. Hello. Hello, Miss Sander. Have you notified the police? I phoned them just a few minutes ago. This is his room. I heard the shots. But when? About an hour ago. You phoned Hanson here only 15 minutes ago. Well, I, I didn't know what it was then. Tommy was going to join me downstairs. When he didn't, I realized it must have been a shot. <sighs> there he is. Yes. Not at all pretty. And definitely dead. There's a note on his desk. A... Suicide note? Let's see. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. It reads, I killed Baker because if he'd been arrested, I would have gone to jail too. I thought I got away with it, but the police suspect he was murdered. I can't take it, so excuse the blood. The note signed Tommy. Well, that sort of clears that up, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. What's that? Tommy's voice wasn't deep enough. Police showed up in a very little while. Tommy's death seemed to be an obvious suicide. I think the police attributed it to insanity. They didn't know what he meant about Baker's having been murdered. As for me, there didn't seem uh, to be much of anything to do at the moment, so I went home and went to bed. This, it would appear, was going to be a case where I didn't sleep. I resisted the impulse to throw the phone out the nearest window and answered it. I'm asleep, and so should you be. Craig. Now that you know I'm at home, good night. Uh, wait a minute. Craig, you told Sandra about someone who came to you in the middle of the night and told you about Baker's murder. Yes, I did. You described that voice very carefully. Craig, would you like to hear it again? Very much. Then come down here at once. The Kent Club on Marshall Boulevard, and I can arrange it for you. The man with the voice you described is here. i would pretty much given up expecting to hear that voice again. But if Hanson said he'd heard it, then it was something for me to find out about. From the time I got the phone call to the time I got to the club, it must have been about a half an hour. Craig, I've been waiting for you. That was the idea, wasn't it? Yes, but that man whose voice I overheard, whose voice resembled the one you told Sandra about. Well? 
He's gone. Well, that's not so good. You know who the man is? No, but I do know something just as good. What's that? I know where the man went. I heard him tell his cab driver. Then let's go there. Of course, Craig, you realize that I'm not absolutely sure it's the man you want. Me? I'm grabbing at straws. Anything at the moment is worth trying. That voice did sound like your description. Baker belonged to the club, too. It's a possibility. Hanson, Sandra told me you'd been stealing money from Baker. I don't think I care for that kind of conversation. I'm not making conversation. I'm asking questions. Was she telling the truth? What difference does it make? If Baker was murdered, it might make a lot of difference. You say if Baker was murdered. Aren't you sure? We'll know better, won't we, when we meet this man whose voice you overheard. Yes, we'll know better. The only thing is, suppose something happens to him? Hey, are we still in the United States? We've been traveling for hours. Apparently, he lives farther out than we realized. Shouldn't be much farther. Craig, mind if I ask you something? Go ahead. It's about Tommy. I can see him committing suicide, all right. He never impressed me as being much of anything. But somehow, I can't see him murdering Baker. People rarely kill other people in front of witnesses. That's not what I meant. Craig, are you sure Baker was murdered? No. But you said before... I said I suspected it. That's something else. However, I am sure of one thing. What's that? I'm sure Tommy... Yes? ...was murdered. I was never a Boy Scout, so I don't know very much about direction in the country. But I was surprised at where I wound up. Where the car wound up was a bumpy dirt road in a very secluded hunk of landscape. Well, that must be the house up ahead. Yes, and the house is dark. Probably took him less time to get here. Must have gone to bed. Probably. There's a mailbox. House number on it. Yes, this is it. Well, let's go visit. Craig, do you think he'll recognize you? Sure. I couldn't see him, but he saw me clearly enough. Well, that's not so good. Are you armed in case he tries anything? No, but maybe he won't try anything. Suppose he refuses to say anything, to speak at all, when he sees you. That'll answer our question just as well, won't it? I suppose so. Shall I ring? Sure. Well, that would be warning him, though, wouldn't it? Suppose he hears the doorbell, looks out, sees you. He might run away. He might. Look, why don't I go around to the back? Then in case he tries to run... That's a good idea. You do that. All right. And be careful. Sure, I'll be very careful. The moon picked out the door, glinted on the metal doorbell. I pushed it. It was a nice night, not too warm, not too cold. However, a guy named Craig was cold. Walking into a dark house with somebody waiting on the other side of the door could have its unpleasant aspects. Nobody answered the doorbell. I hadn't expected anyone to, so I tried the handle. It was very dark inside. I pulled out a book of matches and hesitated. In the darkness, when you strike a match, you make a very nice target. I wasn't sure I liked the idea. On the other hand, I needed a little more action. It would settle things. I lit a match. There was a light switch on the wall, and I flipped it on. Then I walked into the parlor. There wasn't much more to the house than that. Parlor, bedroom, kitchen, and that was all. The bedroom door was open, and no one was in there. The kitchen door was shut, but no light leaked out from under the door. Offhand, you'd have said nobody was home. And maybe nobody was. So I sat down near the table lamp that was the room's only illumination. Somebody made noises in the kitchen. Could have been mice. It could have been the mystery man with the deep voice, or... It could have been a high wind that was slowly swinging the kitchen door open. I decided, whatever it was, that I didn't want the lamp to glare in its eyes, so... I turned off the lamp and quietly shifted from my position next to the lamp to the other side of the room. 
that even matters up. It was dark in the kitchen, it was dark in the parlor, and nobody could see anybody. My unlit friend shifted slightly, and I began to get bored. So I grabbed what felt like an ashtray and threw it against the wall on the opposite side of the room. The little stranger didn't like ashtrays. He tried to shoot the one I threw, but the gun flash gave his position away. I know where you are, and my gun's pointing at where you are, so drop yours. It didn't work. I hadn't expected it to, which is why I moved fast after speaking. I figured he still had three more bullets, any one of which hitting me could be painful, so... <laughs> Drop the pop gun, huh? All right. Thanks. We can use a little electricity now. Hello, Hanson. Craig. My, you're bleeding. Your arm? Yes, I... I didn't know it was you. Who'd you think it was? I... Well, I waited outside for a while. Nothing happened, so I came in. And then when you didn't recognize my voice in the dark, you started shooting at me, huh? That, that's right. Thinking I was the owner of this house? Of course. But Hanson, how could you think that when you yourself own this house? What? But I don't understand. You're not very subtle. When you asked me if I was armed before we got into the house... You said you weren't. Of course. You see, I knew you were going to try to kill me. What? How did you know that? Because you overheard the man with the deep voice. Well, what was wrong with that? You couldn't have heard him. You see, Hanson, the man with the deep voice is dead. The police were glad to get Hanson, especially after I pointed out to them that Tommy's suicide note was a fake. They couldn't have known that, but I did. As I told Sandra, first about the note. You see, it said, the police suspect Baker was murdered. But the police suspected nothing of the sort. You did, though. Yes, but the only one I told was Hanson. And Hanson himself assured me he never spoke to Tommy. Therefore... Hanson killed Tommy after making him write the note? Right. But, Barry, what about the man who spoke to you in the middle of the night? He wasn't Hanson. No. Well, he couldn't have been Tommy. No. Well, then who was he? Sandra, there were three people involved in Baker's possible murder, we thought. You, Hanson, and Tommy. Hmm, that's so. Well, we were wrong. There were four people involved. Four? Who's the fourth? The murderer. Baker himself. Oh. Then we asked, why did the man come to me in the first place? Well, he said to make sure his method of murdering somebody would never be detected. Yeah, that's what he said. But in coming to me, didn't he make sure of the very opposite? Wasn't he making sure that it would be detected? Oh, Barry, you're very, very brilliant. Oh, wait a minute. Now, Baker knew he was going to jail. He also knew that very probably Hanson would try to murder him. He didn't care very much. He was an old man and a sick one. But he did want to make sure his murderer would be punished. Uh, that's funny. What is if Hanson hadn't tried to make doubly sure he was safe, he probably would be safe. I doubt whether there'd have been enough evidence to convict him of your uncle's murder. But he'll hang for Tommy. You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Visitor at Midnight, was written by Louis Vitties. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator, directed by Andrew C. Love. Our cast included Ken Christie, Kay Stewart, Jack Carroll, Byron Kane, and Jack Crucian. Good night, folks. See you next week. Three times mean good times on NBC. NBC.